Good uh, morning, everybody. It's Jeff Copperthite from ESUMS Engineering. I'm here today to present to you Activity 212 from the PLTW CSP curriculum. We're going to walk through pretty much most of this activity, specifically because we need to uh, cover how to use the Firefox Developers Console to answer the questions uh, where it as is asking for Firebug. Uh, in case you weren't sure or, or weren't sure what happened, uh, basically Firebug has been supplanted by the Firefox de Developer Tools, and that. Uh, that usurpation basically took place after this curriculum was republished, revised, and sent out to teachers uh, like myself for um, for distribution. So the directions still include directions for Firebug. So uh, there's, the whole point of this video is just kind of walking you through how do we navigate this activity without Firebug. Uh, before we get started, I do want to uh, request of you to uh, please uh, subscribe to ESUMS Engineering uh, for more PLTW videos such as this for uh, courses CSP, POE, and IED especially. All right, so let's get started. So our activity here is the favorite web page, uh, web browsers and search engines. So we're going to be doing a lot of things with HTML and how pages work in this activity. Uh, favorite web pages, there's reasons that they're your favorite web page. Some of them will be d uh, discussed in this activity, but we're going to again talk about what kind of makes these websites. Okay. So uh, you can do this assignment, and it's recommended you do this assignment in groups. Uh, groups of three to four are fine. It is, lengthy, it is a bit of a lengthy assignment, so we do want to uh, encourage uh, significant amounts of collaboration. All right, so the name of a web page. Now, we talked last um, activity about how when you go to a web page like YouTube or Pandora, you are typing in the domain name server uh, equivalent of an IP address, basically. So you type that in, and then the DNS service looks up the IP address or addresses that information is stored on, and then that information then begins a packet, or that information requests and then begins a packet transfer from those computers to your computer. Uh, the name of a web page it might be a URL, file name, or title elements that are used by browser tabs or bookmarks. So these are things you know. Uh, right off the camera here, I have a, right above this little window here, there's some browser tabs at the top. Uh, one of them, of course, is this activity page. Uh, when you bookmark a web page, it shows up in your browser's history, but it also shows up in a list of sort of like you think of it as your favorite websites. Uh, the content of a web page can also suggest a name for a page. Uh, you know. You, you obviously have lots of favorite websites. Um, just make sure that the website is school appropriate and write that down for number two. Now, we're going to locate our favorite website in a browser. The browser, like Firefox or Chrome, is a client application running on a computer at which you are working, which is the client machine. So the things you are using, things that happen on your computer, are that's called the client. The browser exchanges TCP IP packets, not too similar, not too different from the uh, demonstration from 211. Obviously, a lot faster, of course, speed of light. Uh, to open a connection, request a web page, get the content. Most packets on the internet are TCP IP packets and follow these two protocols. If users visited the co uh, computer you're using, you might see a cached page. That means that it's been stored and, and uh, stored on your client machine, um, previously loaded for a web, ser web server. So certain images are, um, especially back in the days of dial-up internet, it was very advantageous to have images cached, especially if you revisit the website. That way, that does, that way the uh, connection did not need to request the images portion of the page, those being, or even the videos portion, uh, those being, of course, the most data-intensive uh, contents on a page. Um, you can always ensure that you're getting a fresh page by hitting the refresh button. So uh, refresh button here, top left corner right there. I'm not going to hit that right now. I just loaded this before I started this video. Um, does it load all at once or in pieces? When you load a web page, you should notice that the web page does load little bit by little. Usually, you can think of it as sort of a top-down uh, way, but most of the internet connections that we use nowadays are quite fast, and it's entirely possible the entire page will just show up for you. Um, you know, and and that's then that's normal. Okay. Uh, why is it advantageous for a client and server to exchange information in packets? Remember that uh, when you exchange in packets, information is very there's a very little information at each time, and you don't risk a lot of information being lost at once. So if you lose a packet on its way back to the client, it's very easy to at least get that bit of information as opposed to saying uh, an entire web page sent in one packet. That would that that would be uh, a lot harder to restore um, on on a client. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Uh, the web page was just transmitted. You was sent using packets. Why would page load all at once when cached as opposed to in pieces when you hit refresh? Uh, data access on a hard drive is a lot faster than data access over the internet connection, uh, over an internet connection. All right. So now the website that you your uh, for number six, you basically are just going to take that website and you're just going to organize your 
thoughts one sentence at a time about what you feel about uh, the structure of the website, uh, whether it's simple to navigate the website, if things are visible and easy to find, uh, if the user is informed of actions such as errors or changes in state, if mistakes that are made are easy to fix or easy to undo, such as like if you're in a search engine and you mistype something, can you clear the contents of it very fast? And uh, is it reusable? So when you go to different web pages on that website, can you still access certain links in the same places regardless? Um, so that's number six. When you're evaluating your website, you just want to kind of answer those questions. One sentence is fine for all six of those topics. Uh, for what audience was the site intended? How effective is it tailoring to the audience? What makes it effective or ineffective? That's obviously going to be opinion um, based your answer just on what you're looking at. How reliable or authoritative is the information presented on the site and how do you know? Again, you should be able to recognize the ideas about credible sources versus non-credible sources. Uh, so base your answer on that as well. If you were colorblind, vision impaired, blind, or deaf, how would that change the experience on the site you're on? So you got to think about, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a disabled person. Uh, if they're on that website, how would they feel about being on that website? Would it help them? Would it hurt them? Were there things that they could do, things they couldn't do? Um, and you're going to, you know, in class you would do some sort of presentation about uh, this particular uh, website. Um, okay, so we're going to kind of move ahead here a little bit, talking about number uh, 12 starting at number 12 here. The web pages, like other information on the web, are sent from server to client as packets. Thinking back to the last activity, would you still be able to view a web page hosted on the left side of the room from the right side of the room if one of the routers in the middle went out of service? Well, if we think back to our internet simulation, the job of the routers was to move data between sort of pods or areas of a network. So if one of the routers went down, if, especially if it was your only avenue of getting things across information, well then you're not going to get that web page. So if, and another way to look at it is if you have exactly one router and that router goes down, well then information can only be exchanged on one side of the room. So if the web page is being sent from there, from one side of the room to the other and it only has that router to use and that router goes down, you're not going to get that web page. The physical structure of the internet has a lot of what's called redundancy. That's a very important word. You're going to hear that a couple of times in this lesson. Uh, redundancy is the property of having many resources that all serve identical purposes, okay? So when you say things are redundant, um, you can talk about that in language, but, you, but in technology, redundancy means that you have multiple machines or multiple resources that can do the same thing. So if a lot of information or a lot of machines are connected to each other and have the ability to transmit packets along their way, uh, if one of those machines goes down, that means that there's still other machines on the network that can send that information along. Here's a great diagram to kind of display that right below number 12. Let's say you're the uh, client and you're requesting information from server 12. Well, the server in this case is, is item number 12 or node 12 in this diagram. When you request that information, the information could go between ISP 10 or 11 and then to these particular hosts' uh, computers all the way to ISP 2, which is your ISP, back to your client 1, right? So now let's say ISP 10 goes down, right? So now ISP 10 is no longer active. Well, information can still be sent along ISP 11. So you can still have information sent to you from server 12 because it, the rest of the packets could just travel down ISP 1, 11, excuse me. It might be a little slower, but it'll still work. Uh, however, if ISP 2 goes down, then you can guarantee that those packets are not, not, get, not reaching you because there's no other way for you to access server 12. Only ISP 2 is connected to you. Um, if you think about the way the routes traveled by packets on the internet are usually least redundant near the beginning or they're least redundant near the end. Okay, so what does that mean? That's a great question, okay? Re again, remember that redundancy is the ability of multiple machines to do the same thing, okay? So if you look at this diagram, you'll see that ISP2 is the only machine that's tied to client one. So there's no redundancy there at all. ISP2 has to do all the work of, get, of taking the packets and getting them to you. However, ISP2 can get those packets from three different sources, hosts three, four, and five. So if host four goes down, well, so what? Host five and host three can still do the job of getting the packets through, uh, through ISP2 and then into you. So there's more redundancy in the middle of this journey from server 12 to client one. Okay, matter of fact, from server 12, there's actually more redundancy here because this one ISP going down would allow this one to back it up uh, and so forth. So that's a, good, that's a good question, but again, understanding redundancy, the ability to do multiple, sorry, do the same thing on multiple resources. Okay, now request and response. Now we're on part two. Okay, 
Uh, when you enter a web address in your computer, three sets of exchanges occur. Your domain uses domain, sorry, your computer uses domain name servers to get the IP address of the server, as I mentioned before. Uh, your computer exchanges Synapse, which is the web server, to open a connection, and there's more on that to come. And your computer sends an HTTP request. The web server then sends the response and closes the connection. Uh, understanding request and response can help you find what you're looking for, analyzing content reliability, and protect the security and privacy of your information. Uh, the URL, which, by the way, stands for Uniform Resource Locator of a website, is how you direct your browser to a specific site. Uh, here's an example of a URL within the address bar of a web browser. A URL starts with a scheme, such as a file or an HTTP. Or HTTP. Um, the scheme usually is a protocol for exchanging information such as HTTP, HTTPS, or FTP, followed by a colon and two slashes. After the scheme or protocol, the URL has a domain name or IP address, then a slash, and finally a full path to the resource that you would like to view. Uh, there is a parsing URLs document that is available to you at the top of this activity that has a table to help you understand parts of a URL. Uh, if I look at the URL that's up here right now, you can see that this particular URL is coming from pltw.read.inkling.com. Now, we talked about in the last activity that Inkling is the domain, uh, sorry, .com is the top level domain, Inkling is the subdomain, and then that uh, Inkling is allowed to make multiple subdomains, in this case, read and then PLTW. So this is kind of like you know PLTW's Inkling uh, account. And then you have a bunch of resource locations. These all look to be encrypted uh, hexadecimal strings. OK, so getting back to the uh, information here. In the first example, the protocol here is HTTPS, and the domain is mail.example.com. The path to the resource, news-current, slash current, slash index.html. So that's the path. After the question mark is a set of parameters uh, pasted, passed to a website by your browser. Parameters are like arguments in Python, right? So you can say, for example, that the, uh, one of the parameters might be the page you're coming from. Uh, you may, uh, a perfect example of that is when you click an advertisement on a web page, there, there is a uh, parameter that is passed to the owner of that advertisement to say where that came from. And they want to know that because they would like to know where most of their traffic is coming from so they can better optimize their ad dollars. Um, perfect example of that. So each parameter is separated by others and ampersand. So for example, the parameter x in example 1 is assigned the value of 35. So again, if you look back at this diagram, you can see uh, this information in this website. Uh, some URLs include a colon followed by a number between the host name and the slash preceding the resource path. This indicates the port on a server that is being accessed. This is a subset of network traffic received at an IP address specified by a port number. Traffic at any particular port number is usually listened to by a particular type of application or process being accessed on a server. That's a lot of information. Basically, think of it as there. if you think about old school uh, telephones, how there had to be a circuit, uh, a cord connecting two different telephone lines uh, that used to be handled by what's called a switchboard operator. Well, in a web server, there's a very similar, uh, in, in, there's a very similar setup uh, where certain types of traffic are assigned to certain po access ports. That means that, for example, public traffic could access port 1110 uh, or port 80 or port whatever. Uh, and then on that web server, maybe there's another port that's a local access port, right? And it could be a physical port that you're, you're referring to in this case. Um, port numbers are also used by software and hardware to filter packets. Filter only lets some packets through. Unencrypted web traffic typically uses port 80, and the .80 can be omitted from the URL. Okay, so using this, uh, diagram, this, this document to parse uh, diagram URLs to describe the previous step. Two URLs have been diagrammed in the worksheet. Use the remaining rows to parse and diagram the following URL with any other others your teacher provides. So um, you may get more, you may get some, right? So here's an example uh, URL, and we'll kind of parse this just to kind of give you an idea. Uh, the top level domain is .org, the domain is PLTWCS, and then the subdomain is samplehs, so samplehighschool.pltw.cs.org, uh, and the path is students, BKIGAG3, sample.php, and the parameter is F equals 2. So in this uh, particular website, you have all that information presented to you right there. Um, on this one, the uh, top level domain is .com, the port number is 443, see there's where the port number would go. Um, in this case, the... Um, t -t 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 the um, Port path there, the free cool site, oh, sorry, double domain.com. Cool site is the domain, free is the subdomain. Uh, index page one.html is the path, and then the parameters x equals one and y equals three. So on this matching section here on number 16, you basically have to just take all the parts of this, this website and uh, match them up. And I've kind of said most of them already, so you can uh, you know go back and see if you want or try it yourself. Uh, there's a few different. Um, uh, a few different ways that you can kind of look at this and remember that 
HTTPS and port number and a few other things that were in this that were not in the other one. Okay, and last for this video, uh, number 17. Number 17 is likely you use HTTP as your connection protocol most of the time. This protocol specifies what information the client and server will place in the body of the TCP packet and how it will be formatted. The TCP packet is in turn uh, contained with the body of an IP packet and the HTTP packet contains as its payload the actual code for a website. The image shown below is a diagram for this nested packet feature. So basically you have sort of this kind of idea that you have the header for the packet and then you have the TCP header and the HTTP header. So think of it as, remember when you did the simulation on uh, in 211, the first packet that you wrote out was most likely the information packet with who is it going to and how many packets should they expect. So you can kind of think of that as what is, uh, this is this is a diagram of what's contained in that packet uh, in most cases. So you got your IP header, C header, header and your head and then there's the HTML body and then you would get the HTTP body, what's, what's basically part of that header, then the TCP body and the IP body. So where's it going? What protocol are we using? What web protocol? And what uh, content of the uh, web uh, site that are, are we sending? So uh, why do you think it's, it's important like this to take many packages of a simple web, pa web page within your browser? Well, if you think about how long a typical web page really is, um, it would be very difficult to send all that information in the size of one packet. The web page would have to be really small to be sent in one packet. So uh, breaking it up um, into multiple packets is the best way to transmit the information again for the same reason of having lots and lots of um, information being sent in one packet makes it more likely that if that information were dropped you'd be missing pieces of that information. Um, all right, so anyway, so we're going to end this part of the video uh, on that note, on number 17, and we're going to pick up in part two. So please look out for part two, uh, where we will start with part three, which is your digital footprint, and that's where we'll be getting into the Firefox uh, development console. So I hope you have a wonderful day, and again, remember, please like and subscribe to Eastlands Engineering. I hope you have a great day. Take care.